Are you looking for the perfect bracelet for a loved one? Would your man be interested in a personalized keyring from his children? Are you looking for the best priced jewelry, whether it be a necklace, ring, earrings, bangle, or even more? Look no further than Crafted Arts. Crafted Arts is a local business based in Barry within the Vale of Morgan, and they have a range of all the perfect items you need. If it's for the perfect gift for an anniversary, or maybe it's for someone's birthday, maybe something for Christmas, or you wanted to give someone that perfect gift that will last a long time, Crafted Arts is the business for you. If you want to know more or see what they have in stock, then you can visit them locally at 29 High Street, Barry, Villa Morgan, CF627 EB. Or you can go onto their website at www.craftedarts.co.uk. You can even email them at info at craftedarts.co.uk or maybe just give them a call at 077-89-94248. Trust me, it's worth it for the perfect gift. The best thing about Creative Space is that we don't just want to encourage people in being creative in TV, film or even theatre. We also want you to be creative in a variety of other things as well. So do you want to have experience in making jewellery? Do you want to pick up a hobby but do not know what to take or where to start? Then look no further than the Veil Jewellery Workshops. Veil Jewellery Workshops provides the best experience in teaching you how to make the best sterling silver jewellery. They will help you make a range of silverware including rings, bracelets and many more pieces. You will learn the basic silversmith skills such as soldering, texturing, shaping and lots more. Not only do the workshops provide the experience for adults, it also provides the best experience and fun for children as well. So if you want to learn on how to make sterling silver jewellery and if you're very interested, go onto their website at www.veildewerryworkshops.co.uk or get in touch with them via email at info at veildewerryworkshops.co.uk or even phone them at 07789794248. Hello there everyone and my name is Reese Deans of Creative Space Podcast. It feels like it's been a long, long time. It feels like a hundred years, but I am back with a brand new episode here for you guys truly. And I want to say I do apologize it's been this long since getting a podcast out there. I have been really, really busy with other commitments and, and also schedule conflicts. I, I do apologize, people. It's Sometimes it was out of my control. Sometimes I just couldn't get the people I wanted to come on the show, and I've been very unfortunate. But we got to keep going. Creative Space Podcast still needs to live on. So without further ado, my guest on this podcast is none other than the author, presenter, journalist, priest i mean the list of things he has done and the list of things that he is my god i mean where does he find the time and his stories i mean don't get me started on his stories i think it's longer the list of books and stories that he's done it's longer than father christmas naughty and nice list i assure you it is i mean the man oh he's got so much time in the world does he not sleep but we talk about so many things we talk about you know, science fiction, we talk about religion, we talk about Terry Pratchett and, and his friendship, and we, we talk about a lot of things and his, his background story as well. So, without further ado, let's get on to it. It's me and Mr. Lionel Fanthorpe in his home. I gotta say this now very quickly, it's the first time in ages since I've been to someone's home to do a podcast, but yes, it's me and Lionel Fanthorpe in his home in Cardiff, on the Creative Space Podcast. Enjoy, guys. I think it's the first time ever uh, in my podcast history since the first episode, no, second episode, actually, I would have gone to someone's home and did a podcast recording. Right. And... No, you're the, it's been the first time ever since, I think, lockdown and after lockdown and everything that yeah. I can actually go to my guest's home and have a nice conversation. But Lionel Fanthorpe, on my podcast, I mean, how are you? How's it going? <laughs> well, um, I would say that 
I thoroughly enjoying all the work Mark has put in my way and he's bought so many of my stories and he's asked me to record so many of my stories and of his stories that he, I've recorded for him. And uh, I said he's, um, without embarrassing Mark, I would say it was he was rather like the sun coming up over the horizon and re-illuminating the fame that I thought had gone to bed forever. <laughs> and uh, no, he, he's brought me all sorts of work and I'm thoroughly enjoying every minute of it. It's great. Do you know what? I want to go through some of the list here. Yeah, of course what, you can. What you have done. You were a teacher. Well, I started. Um, if, if you want to pick the list up from the beginning. Yeah. Um, I, st I started my working life as yeah. a dental technician. I got it down here as well. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and uh, I went uh, from there. I found out some of my pals. I was on a 10 shillings a week, 50 pence a week. Um, a, a apprentices allowance. Well, of course, you couldn't do anything with that. And I found out that several of my pals who'd been in my class at school were earning three, four, five pounds a week in the factory, just operating a machine. So I went up to become a factory machinist. And uh, I had a thing called a swing press, which I think uh, was I'd always been interested in um, physical development with my wrestling and my boxing and my judo. And uh, I thoroughly enjoyed this because I might well have been in the gym. You sat on your bench and there was a great big steel bar down here and you leaned back so you didn't take your teeth out with it, swung it round there, it in turn drove a central bit down through um, a sort of cyclic centre of the machine. And that then hit, and the only job I did in the factory, and I could still do it today, was to planish stators. I had no idea what planishing meant or what a stator was. <laughs> and a stator is the, the non-moving part of an electric motor inside which the moving part goes and this was a clock factory that they were making mm -hmm. metamic clocks and you just put one of these little gadgets into your swing press you got your hand well out of the way swung the lever around and it came down with enormous force several tons by the time it hit the thing you then bounced it back the other way took the thing out and put it in the dun tray and uh, you had to do 180 an hour to keep up with the factory guidelines mm -hmm. which I was able to do and uh, so that was the first thing that I did after giving up the dental technician work. Yeah, because yeah. I got down here. There was um, so you worked in a factory, done dental, te been a dental technician. There was um, obviously author, presenter, head teacher, priest. Uh, there was journalism. I got a martial arts instructor, weight training instructor. I mean, is there anything you haven't done yet? Uh, I don't <laughs> think so, but I. <laughs> I'm still up for it if there is anything people want me to do. Um, <laughs> anybody invite me, I'll have a go. Though, um, I've uh, since I had the, the latest operation, I'm technically on the disabled list, so I, I can't earn anything. I'd have to do it voluntarily. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, we, we've got a small business called the Fanthorpe Management Consultancy, and uh, anything I get paid for, the money goes into the business. It mustn't come to me. Mm. So um, anyway, Patricia looks after that. She's a, a great accountant, a yeah. lovely girl. And uh, so, uh, yes, I've, I've done all sorts of physical things, working on the farm and uh, weight, as you said, weight training instructor and uh, martial arts instructor, which I... I Tell you one little thing that always occurs to me as funny. Um, when I first came to Glenderu, yeah. I had a nice little music teacher who was very quiet, gentle, and the kids got on top of him sometimes. And one of these rather nasty little lads had threatened him. And uh, they said, uh, well, what the kids said was, I'll get my father and my brother and three of our mates and we'll be waiting for you after school. And the poor chap came into my office and he was terrified. Brought the boy with him. He said, Headmaster, this boy has threatened me. So, uh, with my weightlifting ability, I took him by the lapels, lifted him about two feet off the floor <laughs> before speaking to him. Uh, it gave him an impression of what the old man could do if needed. 
and uh, said, uh, you go and get five of your friends and I'll see you after school at four o'clock. So don't touch Mr. Dabbs. So I set him down, sent him home and uh, got a taxi to take John home and then uh, I was waiting out there from four o'clock till five and nobody turned up. <laughs> and uh, because I was also the martial arts instructor at the Western Leisure Centre, which was only close to the school. Mm. So that, uh, imagine this kid going home and saying, Dad, can you and my brother come down and beat up the headmaster? And his father would have said, wait a minute. He's a martial arts instructor at the Western Leisure. Nah, mate, nah. Oh, I'm, not, I'm not going there. <laughs> no, nah, nah, you're right. <laughs> and uh, my, the highlight of my um, judo career was with Brian Jacks when Brian was in the Olympics. Mm. And hanging up outside, I can show you when we finished all our work. Mm. There's a picture of Brian throwing me and me throwing Brian <laughs> when he was the British Olympic rep back in the, 1978. Never. Oh. Was, yeah, but uh, so I, I cherish those photos. But uh, that was, uh, that, that was you know, the little anecdote that I always like to tell friends about this this boy with his five friends were coming down to do up poor, poor, poor John Downs. <laughs> I think he got the message. Yeah. Well, evidently, yeah. my father, was, father was down the pub. Yeah, no, you carry on. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but when it comes down, I mean, for you, Lionel, your, your work's in writing and in creative. You've yep. written many, many stories that, blimey, even I just go on, how do you find the time? But it's it's the passion, isn't it? That Yes, it's the, as you say, it, there's a certain input. You have a, if you have a number of ideas in your mind, and I'm sure Mark would agree with this in his writing, that they almost force their way out. Um, it's as if you'd got this little thing dancing at the back of my head. I'm an idea, I'm an idea, I want to be written down, please. <laughs> and he comes out and he brings all his friends with him. And uh, the, the science fiction and fantasy that uh, I enjoyed goes back to uh, my school days when I read a lot of H.G. Wells and mm. Jules Verne. Um, I would say that there's also something in fantasy writing which is not a million miles away from theology and philosophy, that you wonder what the universe is hmm. and you wonder what it's all about and you wonder why we're here. And this is the religious side of my thinking that... Hmm. Um, you know, the theological side, trying to explain it and to think about creation and, and God's purpose for the universe. And then um, I think that that comes out in it almost, if I had that creative power, which I have via a book, I can write it as a book or a play or a film. And that then brings out the things you're thinking about, the things you wonder about. And why is the universe here? Okay, so I'll, in that very first story that uh, Mark has gotten, which uh, Martin Austin is looking at, it's the, uh, the pilot of this first spaceship, or this very early spaceship, is a devout Christian. And he wants the universe to have an end so that there will, it will prove that God has made it, that it's a construction. It's not just something that's bubbled up of its own out of nothingness. Mm. But if there is an edge to it, and he's flying at several times the speed of sound, as you do in a spaceship, and um, if he hits it, if there is an edge and he hits it, he's dead. So if the edge he is hoping for, which will prove that God made it, is there, he's dead. If there is no edge, he will go as far as the fuel will allow him and then come back mm. and be alive, but will have lost his theological foundation. Mm -hmm. And how I, I try to solve the problem by when he's gone nearly as far as his fuel will take him, a gigantic hand comes out of nowhere, 
gently catches his ship and turns it round and takes him back to where he set off from. You're not ready, go away. <laughs> yeah, and, and says, uh, yes, I, uh, I don't want you in the afterlife yet. You, you just pop back and tell those idiots who don't believe in me that I am here and I picked you up and took you home. Right? Right. Thank you, Lord. And he <laughs> jumps out and says, there, there is no edge, but there's God. And uh, that's the story. It's, um, uh, as, uh, at 17, uh, I was a trainee Methodist local preacher. Mm. And uh, at 18, I got, uh, I, I got my full certificate as a local preacher. And it, I'm very proud of it because it was um, 1953 and it's signed. Now, wait a minute, get it right. Yes, I was 17 in 50, 18 in 53. And it's actually signed by Donald Soper, who I greatly admired in those days. He ran an organization called the Order of Christian Witness. And uh, or the OCW, and we used to go on missions, and uh, we'd invade an unsuspecting town or city and go knocking on doors and <laughs> inviting people to church. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what? I, I want? I've always wanted to ask you this because you've written many science fiction books, uh, and, yep. and you've always theorised of the possibilities, what is out there, etc. And you, yep. as a priest, mm -hmm. and then writing science fiction, and then write, writing fantasy, etc. Did you ever? In, in your career or in your life, ever had any disputes, debates with other religious um, figures or people in that position? Oh, yes. Rather too many. Because <laughs> uh, <there would> be, <laughs> um, when you do think of like a, a priest, you know, a priest is like, uh, the, the word is gods and uh, etc. And then, and then someone goes, well, what if this? And he goes, no, no, it's only this. But for you, that must well, be... Well, uh, no, no, I... Um, I think I, I truthfully say that I believe in an infinite number of possibilities. Hmm. And I believe the one that is factual is the existence of God and that God created the universe and everything in it and all of us and gave us the power to think and to contemplate his existence. Um, many other priests wouldn't accept that there is life anywhere else. Now, there are so many planets, and we're hearing about this quite recently on the uh, the new telescope that's probing out yeah. there, that there are probably life forms in our own um, solar system. Um, there might be some on Mars. There might be some on the moons of Jupiter, mm. uh, especially the recent discovery of all the water below the surface yeah. on one of the moons of Jupiter. And uh, water is essential, or seems to be, essential for the existence of life or the, for the, uh, the oncoming of life. Mm. And I certainly think that there may be three or four equally intelligent or more intelligent beings than us spread out through this little solar system. And as for the infinite universe out there, there may and probably are millions of very different mm. types of creatures from us with equal or even superior intelligence. Mm. So uh, it doesn't, uh, uh, and I get lots of arguments with lots of priests, oh, yeah, that doesn't agree with the book of Genesis. I said, oh, I didn't write the book of Genesis. <laughs> oh, I, I wasn't here. <laughs> I didn't have uh, a pint with the guy. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> so uh, I would say, yes, I've, frequently argued with what one might call orthodox mm. uh, orthodox theology and orthodox theologians um, especially these um, members of sects which are entirely bible centered mm. and who take every word as literal truth well of course it, it isn't and it can't be yeah. um, not when it not when it confronts science mm. um, I think God gave us the brains that he has given us in order to examine the universe in which he has placed us in a scientific way. And it's uh, God gave us brains that are capable of using science to discover more and more hmm. about the universe 
And what we discover, if it contradicts some three or four thousand year old writings uh, that were put forward in good faith by men who didn't have science, uh, then we've got to go with science. Mm. And as yes, I had lots of arguments on those lines. And sometimes they get quite heated. <laughs> not not on not on my behalf. <laughs> if I get when well, you've yeah. got the Dan Great um, uh, yeah. to prove it, it's like, like, come <laughs> <Yeah>. on. <laughs> I was going to say, if you want to, if you uh, if you don't want to discuss it with words, we can go out in the yard and I'll show you something else. <laughs> Do you know? With um, it was funny because you mentioned the, the the moons of Jupiter and everything. Yes, it was it was interesting because I interviewed uh, a man called David Brin who wrote um, the Postman, which went on to become a Kevin Costner movie, etc. And he was mm-hmm. talking about it. And it was talking about the facts of life, you know, that they are going on moons, um, right. these moons and planets and everything. And it's, um, when when we talk about science fiction, we always talk about aliens, we talk about, you know, outer yeah. space, and it's just the fascination of what is out there, but that's what makes it interesting. Do, right. What would, For you, when did that interest become d- cemented, as you say, in, in your mind? Uh, well, I would think it was a... Maybe the H.G. Wells reading War of the Worlds or something well, like that. Well, rel- relatively gradual process. It was from reading science fiction and mm-hmm. fantasy, which I greatly enjoyed. I think I enjoyed it because it was rather as if you were in a sort of limited environment and you were suddenly given a passport that would let you go outside the city of your own mind and childhood experiences into a world that might exist and I think that I wanted there to be in reality in the real universe some of the exciting things that I'd read about and found so interesting in H.G. Wells and Jules Verne and the um, the, the Brian Aldiss. Mm. There's a very odd coincidence there um, there aren't that many science fiction authors around compared, you know, if you take science fiction fantasy and separate it from general literature, say, well, there aren't that many of us. And Brian Aldous lived in the same street as I did, Norwich Road in Deerham, and he lived just about, I think, eight or nine houses up the road from me. And in the same way, Aldous's shop which was a big um, drapery shop, and uh, they did furniture as well. They were a very big shop. And my father had a relatively small tobacconist, fancy goods, records, musical instruments. On the opposite corner, I thought, there's Brian Aldous and I who were science fiction writers, and there's our two respective fathers who were running two shops within sort of spitting distance of each other in the uh, Deerham High Street and Norwich Road. And uh, no, I said I, I read Brian Aldous. I read um, no, I lost his name just for a second. But um, oh dear, it will return to me in a moment. I will then interrupt so you can re-enter it. Yeah. So, yes. Uh, yeah. It was uh, Stableford. It's come back, Brian Stableford, and uh, I. <coughs> I get on the phone every week to Brian because he he's in a terrible state. He's he's paralysed, and uh, he I was telling him about my catheter and the minor inconvenience of it. He said, "I've got four, mate. Don't grumble <laughs> about one." <laughs> I said, "You're right, Brian." But uh, his brain is totally unaffected. He's still the the um, inspired thinker that all of his books reflect, and he is a great bloke. But I like to try and give him a bell once a week, just because he's just lying there in his bedroom, and yeah. that's all he's got. You know, when you're speaking of friends and everything, I want to... Yeah. I, it will lead into it, but there's a quotation. Now, I know Mark, who is over there, sat in a, in a far corner, being silent, but... Uh, the author, Neil Gaiman, now he has written many, many books. He's written um, American Gods, The Ocean at the End of the Lane, Stardust, Coraline, but he's also the co-author of Good Omens, which is uh, Terry Pratchett. Now, before I go on to Terry Pratchett, who's a, 
I had a very good friend of yes. well, was a good friend of yes he was this is the uh, quotation that Neil Gaiman said do not read too much Lionel Fanthorpe at one go your brains will turn to guacamole and drip out of your ears <laughs> Well, I, I could comment on that by saying that when you have a publisher who sends you a sketch of the cover that he's planning to put on this book and says, I need by return the back page summary and the front cover blurbs. Now, what do you do about that? Well, in this sort of thinking process, when you're looking into what your science fiction and fantasy, because he did the fantasy as well as the science fiction, is going to be about, then I start trying to think outside myself into what might be out there and how might it have been different. And then you've got a whole range of things that I eventually I jotted some of them down so if I couldn't think of them I've got them to refer to. There's uh, um, alien life forms which either visit Earth or we visit their planet so there's um, there's interaction with alien life forms. Then there are things like the threat that we've got now in real life with the the gradual heating of the atmosphere Mm. and so you've got things like Um, disasters on a huge scale that can fall on the earth that um, it could be something like overheating or there's a gigantic meteorite heading for us and is about to drop itself over London or New York Uh, so there's you've got the meeting the aliens either here or there you've got the disaster and how Somehow or other, we avert it or escape from it. And then we've got time travel and whether time exists, whether there's more than one road. I've had a number of stories in which I've imagined that we are all living in parallel universes Mm. which have diverted from one another yeah. And that we've got, um, in these parallel universes, there's another you, there's another me, there's another Mark. And we have done slightly different things because our particular world has differed a little bit from this one. And uh, I've done oh, psychological, sociological bits and pieces where the bloke who was your boss on your Earthl world and you transfer to the other world by some means that you've got, and you find that you are his boss, and that uh, he is the bloke who brings your cups of tea and various things in your study, uh, whereas here, uh, he is the guy who tells you what to do. And you try very hard to bring those two across in the way that you have crossed so that they can see what life can be like the other way around. Yeah. So they're what I would call, as well as the mechanical science fiction where you visit or travel, there's the psychological science mm. fiction where you can, um, or you imagine what might have happened had Hitler not apparently suffered some kind of brain damage in World War One, which had made him into the, you know, made him into the, the man he was mm. and caused the war and all the suffering. And imagine that that injury hadn't happened and he comes to, to lead Germany and Europe but as an entirely good and benign and caring leader. And uh, at his death, everybody is dreadfully disappointed and... Uh, you know, what a wonderful man he was. And yet, you see, that I'm, I'm trying to draw um, sort of psychological and philosophical answers from that and looking at the possibility that if something had not happened to yeah. someone, a brain injury perhaps or a physical injury, like the... Um, it, was, it was funny because when you mentioned Adolf Hitler, 
Sorry yeah. to cut you off in uh, line. No, no. It was uh, the, the, there was the story of Hitler in the in the First World War. Yes. When um, one of the Allied soldiers pointed a gun at a German soldier, and he was out in the middle of no man's land, and he did not know what to do. He, d- he didn't know whether yeah. to kill him, and because obviously in the First World War, he was like no one wanted to fight and anything. No. So he just let him go. But then it was it, <coughs> it was revealed. Through many sources and everything, that that person that he let go was, was Adolf Hitler. Was Adolf Hitler, and, it's, and it does. And if he'd you... shot him there and then, yeah, the Second World War would not have happened. Yeah, the Nazis would not have taken power. That's an amazing thought, isn't it? Just finger on the trigger. Yeah, and it and it, and you're saying about you know psychologically and theorizing and everything. It's like, oh, what if that? What if the, it's the it what it... opens up all these other parallel worlds? Yes. And you go, why? Right, which one do you want to pick and have you choosing? It's like, it's like having. I mean, I can always say it's the. I keep mentioning the Simpsons movie because there was a scene in the Simpsons movie mm-hmm. where the, the the villain sends, uh, gives the president five files, and he goes, pick out of these five files what do you want to do with Springfield, and that will happen. It's sort of like that. It goes, the fate is in someone's hand, yes. and you never know what you could have done. I mean. That guy may have may have survived the war and just turned out and gone, oh, damn. Yeah. If only, you know, and it's it's mad to think that way as well, to open up possibilities. Are you looking for the perfect bracelet for a loved one? Would your man be interested in a personalised keyring from his children? Are you looking for the best priced jewellery, whether it be a necklace, ring, earrings, bangle or even more? Look no further than Crafted Arts. Crafted Arts is a local business based in Barry within the Vale of Morgan and they have a range of all the perfect items you need. If it's for the perfect gift for an anniversary or maybe it's for someone's birthday, maybe something for Christmas or you wanted to give someone that perfect gift that will last a long time, Crafted Arts is the business for you. If you want to know more or see what they have in stock then you can visit them locally at 29 High Street, Barry, Vale of Morgan, CF62 Seven E B, or you can go onto their website at www.craftedarts.co.uk. You could even email them at info@craftedarts.co.uk, at or maybe just give them a call at o double seven eight nine nine four two four eight. Trust me, it's worth it for the perfect gift. The best thing about Creative Space is that we don't just want to encourage people in being creative in TV, film or even theatre. We also want you to be creative in a variety of other things as well. So do you want to have experience in making jewellery? Do you want to pick up a hobby but do not know what to take or where to start? Then look no further than the Veil Jewellery Workshops. Veil Jewellery Workshops provides the best experience in teaching you how to make the best sterling silver jewellery. They will help you make a range of silverware including rings, bracelets and many more pieces. You will learn the basic silversmith skills such as soldering, texturing, shaping and lots more. Not only do the workshops provide the experience for adults, it also provides the best experience and fun for children as well. So if you want to learn on how to make sterling silver jewellery and if you're very interested, go onto their website at www.veildewerryworkshops.co.uk or get in touch with them via email at info at veildewerryworkshops.co.uk or even phone them at 07789794248. Right. So going on to Terry Pratchett then. Yes. So, I mean, when Mark was telling me that you, you two were friends, yes. I mean... I, I looked at you. You two are sort of similar ways. You had the the Indian sort of the hats, the leather jackets, and everything. Yes. Yeah. Um, so where did where did that friendship come from, and how was it developed? Well, let me just think back to when we first met him. I think I would read a lot of his stories, liked them very much, and having sold my first story in nineteen fifty two. I had my 50th anniversary as an author in print uh, in 2002 and I invited a lot of top science fiction writers like Brian Stableford, Terry Pratchett and I said it's my 50th anniversary and uh, uh, I said I'm a great admirer and enjoyer of your work, would you come down and give a little talk for me? and. Uh, to my surprise and delight, they and two or three other 
prominent science fiction author said, yeah, we'll come down. It's a, it's a rare occasion. And then, uh, of course, 20 years later, I did my 70th anniversary. And, you know, all the paperwork is up on the wall, on the uh, just outside yeah. as you come in the door. And uh, so this was how I got to know them, because of their kindness to me. Mm -hmm. um, when... Uh, I would say they, uh, it, it, I felt it was very, very nice of them to come down and do a talk at my anniversary celebration and uh, th then we became friends afterwards. That's how I became a friend of Brian Stableford. <coughs> and friend of Brian Stableford and a friend of Terry Pratchett's. Mm. And uh, yes, we, we found we had a lot in common, as you said, the leather jacket on my head. And uh, I think, a lot of authors with the the leather jacket image, uh, a lot of authors almost see themselves at times as characters in their books. And I've, mm -hmm. uh, I have this character who keeps cropping up under various names, probably in most of the 200 books I've written, where he is the, he is the sort of, um, well, the man I've tried to be in real life. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the the fighting man and the guy who would uh, um, the guy who would intervene if there's uh, anything going on that shouldn't be I can remember you know just one or two occasions when I've uh, had the opportunity to step in when somebody was um, won't go into the details but there's this bloke the poor girl I saw was just walking down the street and this uh, poor girl tried to run out of the house. And the bloke who was with her grabbed her hair and dragged her inside. So I thought, something very nasty here. And I just I went tapped on the door. I said, uh, the girl answered it. I said, do you need any help? And she said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, you go. I will have a word with him. <laughs> and uh, one of the things I'm rather proud of. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. And uh, I don't think he'll treat it her again. But I said I would return if I ever heard of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, with all your, your stories and your yep. books, and it, is, is there any particular story that you feel you would like even to see on the te on the television or on, in film or as a play? Is there any particular... I, I know it's going to be seen that, oh, yeah, it's like picking out of all your babies or your children and you know, yeah. picking which one, um, but is there anything that has crossed your mind? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, let me think. There's, to try and think of it, one of the particular adventures. There, we usually have, <coughs> um, it would be difficult to pick a particular one by mm. the title without looking at my list. And I would say that I like a number of my stories yeah. contain um, rescues or somebody risking his life to... Um, save an expedition that's trapped and looking at one recently I can't remember the title the trouble is when you've written that many you yeah. don't remember the titles very easily yeah. or you remember the story and you don't associate it with that particular title and uh, this was uh, it's just one of the, the rescue stories where the guy who is doing the rescuing has to go into the dangerous place in order to save his friends or a member of his family who's stuck in there and uh, sometimes loses his own life in re in doing the rescue. Yeah. This, is, this would seem to me to be the, um, the ultimate expression of caring for others. If, if their life means more to you than yours does mm. and you say, if I can't save him or her, as the case may be, then uh, I don't want to go on living without them. I will go and give it everything I've got hmm. to get them out of that particular distress or that yeah. particular threat. That's about the nearest I can do for an answer on that because that it's without, without having a list or one of my books in front of me. Oh, yes, that's that one, yes. yes. 
<coughs> Sorry about this, Carl. No, no worries. Uh, also, <coughs> since, uh, apologies <coughs> if anyone's listening. We've got some window fixes in the in the distance. Yeah, so, uh, no, that's absolutely for no. Um, but I love the natural. Anything to do with my podcast. If it's natural, then yeah. If then it's natural, it's good. It's good. It's Anything's real. good for me. So, when you progress, I mean, looking back, I mean, when I see your your science fiction stories and everything, I see the covers, it just reminds me of 1960s and 1970s oh, yes, science it's fiction. Oh, yes, it's all 60s. Mark introduced you to the majority of them. And um, yeah. what was the one that we watched? It was, uh, um, what was it, Mark, where the, the entire village disappeared? And what TV series was that? And only one stayed and she contacted this group. Oh, well, you've got me going now. As yeah. Well. Talk about putting us on the spot. <laughs> um, but... Uh, I have a thing of that one. Oh, but yeah, no, I'll put it in my brain and start thinking about yeah. it. Yeah, but there was like Doctor Who as well, and uh, it it always reminds me of uh, all these sixties and seventies. That yes, um, are you? Do you ever have a particular favourite uh, science fiction? What, what was it? I've got it. It was an episode of Department S. Department S. That oh, was yeah. it. The Pied Piper of Hambledown. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. And you just drag that up from the brain. So, yeah. <laughs> where is it? Where yeah, is it? Where yeah. is it? <laughs> but well, yeah. I... In the very early Doctor Who, and I've forgotten who played the Doctor in the first ones. William Hartnell. Yes. I used to enjoy those immensely. Mm. They were very good. And uh, the... Um, let me try and think back. My, uh, I must apologise in that my memory at 88 is not like it was at 48. <laughs> and uh, I'm trying to think back now of some of the series I particularly enjoyed, and I... Having, I find it very difficult to remember them. I know the, the Doctor Who I certainly enjoyed yeah. a lot. And uh, we used to like their... Oh, dear. I think uh, we talked about Quatermass. Oh, the Quatermass. Oh, yes, yeah. Quatermass and the Pit. Yes, yeah, I, yeah. I, I like Quatermass. He was yeah. good, yes. Yeah. And uh, uh, what is that series where... Uh, I can't think of names... The the hero was the, uh, the there was Bones was the doctor and there was the ship's engineer Star Trek Star Trek Star Trek yeah, yeah. I used to love beam Star- me up Scotty <laughs> yeah beam me up Scotty yeah yes I used to love Star Star Trek that was uh, one of my favourites and uh, this seemed to be this this big I mean science fiction seemed to have this big impact in the fifties sixties and maybe the seventies as well mm. maybe do you think that that's because in terms of historical looking into the history that because it was the the height of the i don't know the cold war and there was yes. a, and the, the fact that <laughs> you know nuclear and oh big giant ants now less because of nuclear you know it's uh, yes 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 that was i think that the two went together there is a very real sense in which the uh, the situation outside you makes an impact on your thinking process mm. and this affects authors as well and uh, and their readers and if there are dangers of a particular type like the war with Russia and nuclear bombs and you think to yourself well let's imagine what would happen let's do something about it in the writing almost as if the writing could produce an answer that the real universe couldn't mm. and that you escaped um, into the literary world yeah. and the world of plays and films. Yeah, comforting the people just to calm them down. Yes, you know, and yeah. yeah. You, want to, you want a story which parallels the dangers that you are facing in the real world and which comes up with um, an answer, uh, an escape. Mm. Um, a conquering of what is evil and difficult uh, I think that the two things do go together there's an intermesh between them if we think back to let's say Charles Dickens mm. and all the sociological stuff that Dickens wrote about orphanages and you know all the, the yeah. people who were poor and uh, lived through difficulties and came out of them so I, I think we could make an interesting point about the relationship between literature and the real world in which that author lived. Mm. And uh, we think of, well, let's take the, the classic of all time is Shakespeare. Mm. 
and the Shakespeare plays reflecting the threats in which Elizabethan England, if you if you were an Elizabethan citizen, those threats were there. Yeah. And and still modern to this day, I mean for, for Shakespeare's play <coughs> to to be still here yes. and still have the same topics, the same themes if you like. Mm-hmm. And that's why even Charles Dickens is still around because it's still happening and then yes. and then you've got yes. um, uh, I can't think of the names at the top. I was going to say H.G. Wells as well because yes, uh, yes. Yeah. Every time uh, I think of H.G. Wells, I do think of all the worlds, but I just think of Orson Wells' um, audio drama that freaked out a nation. Yes, <laughs> yeah. Oh yes, uh, yeah. That, that one. Yeah. Oh, it's coming. Oh, get your guns. <laughs> yes, it's coming. It's coming. Oh. And uh, yes, they. I think the link there is an important one mm. between. We can either solve it. The the author is the master of the story. He can write what he wants to write. Whether or not you'll sell it is another matter. But you are, in a sense, in charge of the universe that you've created. And this is why science fiction and fantasy in particular, um, you create the whole new universe. Mm. You're not constricted as Shakespeare was by the Elizabethan period, or as Charles Dickens was by the Victorian period. You can you can get, I'm thinking also of Conan Doyle and uh, the, the things that he did, uh, which reflected the period. There are, if you're a science fiction and fantasy writer, you can escape from the bars which held Shakespeare and Dickens mm-hmm. and Conan Doyle. And you can get out into a completely different universe, inhabited by completely different creatures with completely different motives, and you can have power that you haven't got here. You, you can slide between the dimensions, mm-hmm. or you can... If parallel worlds exist, you can slide into that parallel yeah. world. Or you just crossed into the Twilight Zone. Dun, dun, dun. So. Yes, <laughs> yes, indeed. If, if I, can, and I, I know I'm a bit distant, so I hope you can help hear me, but uh, one of the things that, that you know, I'm, I'm now putting my professional hat on as yeah. a mental, yep. mental health specialist and relaxation therapist and stuff like that, one of the techniques that we use uh, to help people mm-hmm. is you get them to write down their problems right. write down on paper the things that are bothering them write down things that they would like to solve mm-hmm. now in a similar sort of way I was chatting not to you Lionel but to, a, to another author a little while ago and he was sort of saying sorry about the noise in the background but yeah. he was actually saying that when he is writing a story and he was a, he was a sci-fi and fantasy author as well it's almost as though he is channeling his subconscious which is his way of escaping from a problem or situation that he is facing. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, we could say now, as uh, you know, here in 2023, there is still the threat of nuclear war. There is still the threat of viruses and so on going Yes, down. yes, and well, the COVID. Of, exactly, that's a good example. And a lot of people are very frightened by these things. And, you know, like your everyday person going about their work or you know, living their lives, this is a niggle in their, in their, in Very their much so. all the time. Yeah. You know, what, what's going to happen? Yeah. And writers, whether it be sci-fi, fantasy, or, or anything else, do seem to have this ability to channel those, shall we say, negative thoughts, right. and release them onto paper. And so, and, and this guy was telling me it's actually a, 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 he, it, it salves himself. You know, it makes him feel better. Mm. He hasn't solved the situation in the real world, but he's put his mind at rest. Yeah, yeah. And I think you've I, probably done that. I would agree with that a hundred percent. That that's made it very clear um, what the process is. Yeah, yeah. And that uh, it may well be that science fiction and fantasy authors want to get even further away than Shakespeare or Dickens. Mm. They they would have. Characters in difficulty who survive and escape. Yeah. Um, in the science fiction world, you don't have a character or an individual 
who survives and escapes. You change the environment. You you stay as you, and you throw the environment somewhere away, mm. and then you can live very happily in the new environment. That I mean, I've done some stories like that in which, um, you know, a visitor from another planet who is technologically far more advanced than we are, will come along and uh, will be a, a kind and helpful and supportive person, like the work that Mark does. Um, and will, as it were, change the, it won't change the character, but he will come and rescue this man or woman by turning the environment around mm. in a way that they could never do. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and I think there's something else that you mentioned a little earlier, which I am aware of as well, is that having read a lot of your books, Yes, brave man. Yeah, yeah. My brain hasn't got to mush yet. Yeah, I was going to uh, say. Yeah. Uh, but, but, and, and, and having known you for such a long time, I can now, with a fair degree of certainty, establish which character you are. Ah, oh, right. Yeah, and it's like, ah, there's Lionel. Yes, you know. there he is. And, he, and, oh, and as you he say, he really, it's usually... The, the warrior priest type Yeah, role. It, it is the warrior it's priest. The warrior yeah, priest yeah. Type role. Leather jacket, and the hats and everything. Yeah, you know, that's the whole thing. And, and actually, I reread a few of my books. Right. And, I, and, and, and my wife says, well, I know exactly, and she types all my manuscripts. As yeah, know, like Patricia, like Patricia you, died me. And Anna says, well, I know which character you are straight away. Yeah. I don't even have to read more than four or five paragraphs. That's you. That's you. And, and right. I think that's another way that people like us channel perhaps some of our, I don't know, we're, we're not insecurities or anything, but, you know, like, we're escaping into the fancy world. Oh, if only we could yes, if, do that. It's the if only, And yes. probably a lot of what we would like to do would not be legal and we'd be in, inside. Uh, yes, we would. <laughs> so, we would. Yeah. But it's Get a out. Way, but it's yeah. a way of yes. manifesting that self without yeah. getting into trouble. Yeah, that, that is absolutely right about that. As an analysis, that... It says it all. It's, uh, it's what a fantasy and science fiction author does. That, uh, mm. And, I mean, you could do it equally well with uh, a good detective story. You could make yourself into Sherlock Holmes. Yeah. Um, I but mean, I lo yeah, I love... My, I mean, f funny enough, it was like I was showing Mark earlier, I've written, I've written a murder mystery play. Right. And... Um, and I won't go into so much detail because I'd like to have it. I don't want to break away the mystery or anything, but it's... One of the things is, as a writer, that you you think is what what would I do as that character? What would I do as my detective? Exactly. How do I solve it? You are the character, so I wouldn't want to be like Stephen King of going into his mind and thinking, "Oh my God, you're the killer clown. You're this. You're that." Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's just, and it, it's well, because I, I, it popped into my head, and it was funny because you went, you've been interviewed by Scarred for Life. I don't know if you remember. It was a. A YouTube show called Scarred for Life and News, um, and they they cover the sort of the seventies, eighties, sort of like the the scary, the scary side of um, um, of society, and you know how they did the the adverts of you know don't leave any electricity in the house, otherwise if your house will blow up or something like that. And right, one of the things, right. and one of the things they covered was Threads, the the TV sh uh, film Threads, and even to Today, I mean, I watched it for the first time. I don't know how long ago. It was like a couple of months ago. Right. And I I, I remember, because I had to watch it on the computer. I remember as I went to press stop, my hand was shaking. <laughs> yeah. Because how, even now, even though it's a very, even back then, obviously because of the height of the the, the Cold War with Ronald Reagan, et cetera, et cetera. Yes. But it's still relevant. It's still, and even though the... The person or the filmmakers are writing it are only speculating and theorizing because it's science fiction. You can do yeah. it so that way, yeah. but then it, it's it does hit the nail on the head and it and it channels fears and wonders and that. And it was me and shaking on my computer, yeah. going, "Oh my yeah, god!" I couldn't believe it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I thought I had but to go it's because that threat. Yeah, that, I think the threat was in the seventies. Right? I know it was the eighties, early eighties. Okay, yeah, maybe in the eighties. But here we are in the twenty twenties, and unfortunately, that threat still exists oh it does we talked about living through the cold war um yeah. because of kind of like what's going on in the world now the, the focus is back on that it and is so you know 
mankind and it goes back to you, you know early what you were saying Lionel about God or whoever you want to say giving mankind the ability to think and unfortunately one of the one of, one of the uh, consequences of that is we've dreamed up all these horrendous weapons which at the yeah. flick of a switch we could destroy the entire world yes we and could unfortunately it's like once you've invented that you can't uninvent you can't it. uninvent it's like no, when you see a photograph or a picture that is not very pleasant mm. you can't unsee it no. and that's lodged in your mind yeah um and i say here we are what 40 plus years later yep. and still there is a potential threat it is uh and and with a huge amount of 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 power if that's the right word mm. in the hands of a very few people who've only got to press a button and yeah. we're doomed and we're doomed yeah. Oh, well, we've got time uh, for a quick one. On the note. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, we've got time for a quick one down the pub. It's all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> for a quickie. Yeah. Well, it, it, funny enough, it, just to be topical, the alert we all got on our phones. Oh, yes. Yeah, sure. Or yeah. most of us got, apparently. Yeah. And, uh, oh, was that the football? in Wales, we had a, a, a spelling mistake on it. Is yes. That right? And a German word crept in, and we thought, what's all this about? One, oh. Apparently one network didn't carry the alert. And I saw that there was a chap in Ireland, I think it was, right. who did a screen grab of his alert, and it was complete gobbledygook. It was like machine language. And he made the comment, he said, well, thanks for the alert. It's absolutely no good at all. So no idea what he's talking about. Yeah. No. You unless know. unless you hear the the siren. You, it, you, for sure. As, as, my, uh, as my band would always say, when you hear the siren, crouch down to your knees, put your hand... Uh, Ants over your head and kiss your ass goodbye. That's all we yeah. have. <laughs> kiss your ass goodbye. Yeah. Are you looking for the perfect bracelet for a loved one? Would your man be interested in a personalised keyring from his children? Are you looking for the best priced jewellery, whether it be a necklace, ring, earrings, bangle, or even more? Look no further than Crafted Arts. Crafted Arts is a local business based in Barry within the Vale of Morgan, and they have a range of all the perfect items you need. If it's for the perfect gift for an anniversary, or maybe it's for someone's birthday, maybe something for Christmas, or you wanted to give someone that perfect gift that will last a long time, Crafted Arts is the business for you. If you want to know more or see what they have in stock, then you can visit them locally at 29 High Street, Barry, Vale of Morgan, CF62, 7EB or you can go onto their website at www.craftedarts.co.uk You can even email them at info at craftedarts.co.uk or maybe just give them a call at 077-89-94248 Trust me, it's worth it for the perfect gift. The best thing about Creative Space is that we don't just want to encourage people in being creative in TV, film or even theatre. We also want you to be creative in a variety of other things as well. So do you want to have experience in making jewellery? Do you want to pick up a hobby but do not know what to take or where to start? Then look no further than the Veil Jewellery Workshops. Veil Jewellery Workshops provides the best experience in teaching you how to make the best sterling silver jewellery. They will help you make a range of silverware including rings, bracelets and many more pieces. You will learn the basic silversmith skills such as soldering, texturing, shaping and lots more. Not only do the workshops provide the experience for adults, it also provides the best experience and fun for children as well. So if you want to learn on how to make sterling silver jewellery and if you're very interested, go onto their website at www.veildewerryworkshops.co.uk or get in touch with them via email at info at veildewerryworkshops.co.uk or even phone them at 07789794248. Come on, but we gotta go lighter now, otherwise my my friends will literally beat me up if I do not mention this TV program, 14 TV, which still makes people think and everything. But yes. but so it was channel four. Mm -hmm. Was it so Channel Four, um, fourteen TV, um, in the nineteen nineties, I believe it was. Yeah, yeah. I've, uh, it was on that little box. Um, yeah. Oh, uh, the Patricia. Oh no, um, it wasn't you two pals. It was the guys who were doing the window. Pat was just shoving. One of them saw the notice about me and my radio and TV, and said, "Who oh, was here?" And Betty, and she showed them. That little box set of 14 TV, yeah. which has just come out again. How do you say that? Is it 14 or 14? Or... Well, I would say 14 myself. 14. But I'm a Norfolkman. 
Yeah. And I, I tend to talk like a country bumpkin when I'm relaxing. And I, we were definitely in Norfolkian dialect, say 14. Yeah. We well, would, a lot of people don't actually know why it's called 14. So they don't know about could, Charlie Ford. You could say about Charles Ford. Yeah, yeah sure. sure. Yeah, please tell <coughs> Well, sorry about this. Oh, no, 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 absolutely. Don't worry. Like, no. Anyway, um, I was intrigued by the writing of Charles Ford. Charles Ford lived back in the 20s and 30s. Mm and was an American investigator of, uh, well, he had a, what we could sometimes suggest was a Fortean philosophy. And there is a Fortean society of which I'm a member. Mm -hmm. And um, he looked at things that didn't seem uh, simple or right. He liked to look at mysteries of all kinds, whether why one place was a desert and another place was a jungle. Why? And then he'd look into things like um, why... Oh, let's just think of some of the examples. Fish falling from the sky. Fish, Yes, a rain of fish. Where the dickens yeah. did they come from? I was watching that one last night. Ah, <laughs> right. <laughs> I was watching that one last night, yeah. And then he would also um, look into mysterious appearances and disappearances. There was the... Um, uh, Kaspar Hauser, who suddenly turned up in Nuremberg, young man of 18 or 19, and uh, he didn't know where he was or where he'd come from, and he, he couldn't speak to start with. And he was, uh, they were very kindly people, and they took him in and fed him and looked after him, gave him a home and taught him to speak German. And uh, then three years later, somebody murdered him, <laughs> which was. I shouldn't be laughing, but it was No, like... but it was a, you know, there's a mysterious guy appears from nowhere, doesn't know who he is. The only words he can speak, he says, Kaspar Hauser, which is why they called him Kaspar yeah. Hauser. And then there's the, uh, the other one which intrigued me, which was the disappearance. I've forgotten his name, but he was a diplomat during the Napoleonic Wars. Mm. And he was the son of the Bishop of Norwich. And I, I can find it for you in a couple of seconds, the, his name, or it may even come back to me. And uh, he was going through Pearlberg on his way. He'd, he'd been sent on a diplomatic mission. He was a British diplomat, mm. only 23 or 4, um, but had a very high place in the diplomatic corps. He'd been sent to negotiate with Austria to attack the Napoleonic forces as they advanced, and then he would tell his government and the British forces would attack at the same time mm. so that Napoleon was trying to fight on two fronts and the hope was that he would be defeated because they'd attacked him in two places at once. And big as his army was, well, in fact, he dealt with it very quickly and easily. But that was the theory behind it. And uh, this guy, as I said, the, the son of the bishop who was the diplomat, um, got Pearlberg, and he was trying to make it in a very dangerous country with a lot of Napoleon's secret agents there who certainly were looking for him. They stopped at this inn. He had his valet um, and his sort of coach driver with him. They had gone out of the inn to get the coach ready, and he walked around the horses where his valet stood holding the door open on the coach and was never seen again and I wish I could think of his name I can't get Casper Hauser out of my mind <laughs> but he wasn't that that was the, the different they were both on the same 14 series that. yeah but, but um you see it's that kind of story that intrigued me on yeah on 14 as to why does somebody disappear well we could only assume that the common sense suggestion would be that um, one of Napoleon's men got him, dragged him off into the woods, killed him and shoved him under a tree somewhere yeah. and he was never found. But uh, he was only a young man. He a beautiful little 21-year-old wife. They hadn't been married long. She went all the way to Pearlberg looking for him. She was desperate about him to see if she could find what had happened to him. She found nothing. You couldn't get any clue at all as to where he'd gone. So you get... Events like that in 40 mm. and the disappearance. Anyhow, going back to Charles Ford, um, 
I was fascinated by all the things that he'd written and all the things he'd investigated, but I was also very interested in him and his approach to life, that through all the things he reported, he could also see a humorous sidetrack. There was, um, I think it was his psychological defense to a world of strange mysteries and strange threats that uh, he could laugh at them. He, he, would find, uh, he would find something funny about the bloke disappearing into the woods. Ha, you know, had he seen a fairy or had the elves taken him away or had a big owl come down out of the tree and picked him up? You know, an owl with 10 foot wingspan. Um, that was what appealed to me about Fort mm. and his investigations. And I tried to do mine in the same way as a yeah. as a tribute. We called it Forty and TV as yeah. a tribute to him. And his style of investigation. Um, trying to think of some of the other mysteries we did, but we looked at things like that rain of fish that yeah. you heard was there, there um, spontaneous human combustion? Yes, there was. There yeah. was. Yeah. No, I was trying to think of. Uh, a great difficulty remembering the bloke who flew on fire, but he did. Yeah. I would need to look at the book. <laughs> <laughs> but it was with um, talking cats. Yes. Or cat language, something like yes, that. Yes, cat language. Yeah. Was that was yeah. not well, cat one. language. You got a cat. Off. <laughs> I mean, there's a picture. <laughs> oh of yes, it. that was. He was. Um, he was my loyal, loving friend for about twelve or fourteen years. He yeah. finally died of old age, mm. but uh, he was, his, his name was Tiggy. 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 Oh. And there's one of them, the, the top one, shows what his real nature was like. Yeah. And the photographer who did it for me said, can we get one of him looking fierce? And the photographer was doing this to him and going, Psh. and then finally he spat back. <laughs> and then he took it, but uh, the photographer had to irritate him before he'd do that. <laughs> on on uh, Just going back on 14 TV and Charles Fort, yep. wasn't Charles Fort's book, I think he probably wrote more than, than one, but... Was it something about the damned, the book of the damned? What, why was? Why did he call it? The oh, damned? I think was, he did call it the damned. Was it because it was think. just these were unusual incidents that he was investigating, and he thought there might be some devilish yeah. work there? Or? Yeah. Yes, I think he just used damned in the sense of. I'll be damned. Uh, uh, yeah, the the people who were damned, and the uh, guy who disappeared, yeah. and the guy who. Uh, or the people, got, you know. like the quote, the saying goes, "Well, oh, I'll be damned," you know. Yeah, well, I'll be it, damned. You yeah. know, it was uh, in that sense. I don't think Fort was religious. No. He um. He was too busy for looking what the universe really was, mm. and why certain things contradicted common sense. And I think there's another. I'm sorry to cut across you, Reese, because I know this is your podcast, but. <laughs> Um, I think there's another link there because you know we talked about the the, uh, the, 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 the the it was raining fish. Yes. Didn't it rain frogs? And did that give you the idea for your frog books? Well, of the frog books, you've got to yeah. see the frogs over there. I was no, going to say. Yeah, 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 they're all there. That's <laughs> the one that's meant to be me. The one that just behind the picture of the queen. Yeah, yeah. Under the clock mark, you know, turn around, and wrote the other way. Oh yes. The the one with the dog collar. It's just behind the, the card. Oh, it is. Here. There we are. Yes. Yeah, him. Yeah, yeah. That is the Reverend Doctor Who, John Green, who is meant to be me. <laughs> and uh, But did you, um, uh, when 14 TV yep. came on Channel 4, um, obviously, I mean, I was born in 1996, so I don't know uh, the, the height of it and everything, but what, for you, was you, was you just doing, obviously, you, was you just expecting it to reach a certain audience, or was you... Um, surprised that it, it became so popular. Um, it, it did. I, I, I was very surprised by how well it took off. And we did a second series because it took off so yeah. well. Because normally with some, with some, I think, programmes like that, I mean, we get some on the telly now. I mean, Mike Bamp is obsessed with ancient aliens and everything. And, right. Uh, but right. you get some TV shows like that. But if it's not because of maybe 14 TV that it paved the way for other shows... Um, but a lot of people, I mean, I've, I've spoken to a, a few people who watch 14 TV and they always go, oh, you know, the the original one, even though there's probably a few more before 14 TV, made, you know, but it's like if it wasn't for 14 TV, then it didn't pave the way for uh, other... A lot of others. Other well, shows. Lionel, of course, is, yeah. is, it regularly pops up on ancient yeah. 
being interviewed. Oh, you were? Yeah. 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 And, yeah. And, and lots of these other types of shows. Why didn't yeah. you say that? <laughs> God. Uh, I'm going to go on the phone to my pap now. I was like, bam, we've got to watch them all. We've got to watch them all. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'd forgotten, but Mark is right. I just, I'm afraid of, of, um, of recent weeks and months, I've, um, I had um, a microscopic mini stroke, which um, the only symptoms were that I was just talking gibberish. And mm. if I was trying to say... Uh, ah, yes, I presented 14 TV. It would come out as R43 projection. It was just gibberish. Yeah. And uh, so it stopped of its own. Hmm. And uh, my doctor, being a particularly good GP, thought I ought to go up and have one of those head examinations where they stick you in this device in mm. the x-ray department and then the device rotates around your head yeah. taking pictures of the brain and I just a couple of days back I got the report of that and it uh, said it was from my the doctor at the hospital saying I'm very pleased to report that everything in your brain is normal so but nevertheless my memory is still failing yeah. me but it, it was it happens was, to us all it, yeah. yeah you know we're both a bit younger than you well i'm younger than you reese is younger than me yeah and we'll both go oh do you remember um, um oh, what and was it, it called? won't and come it, yeah, I know. yeah time. but uh at uh at 88 i have a difficulty remembering a lot of things that i could remember well mm. 20 years ago but i think what we're saying here is that you know you were well known obviously before 40 and db is oh yes the, yes but 40 and tv if you like brought you to a a wider audience yes yeah. and I as think a result it is, of that yeah, especially with Channel 4 you know being at sure. the height that yeah. it was back in the yeah. day yeah. I mean it's still mm -hmm. I mean it's still relevant now but when you when you think of when you think of Channel 4 now it, it's like it, it's part of it, it's blended in sort mm -hmm. of ways with yes. television but with Channel 4 because obviously you had Sky I mean the height of Sky and the height of whatever um, yeah. all the other television and satellites etc but Channel 4 was its own big commodity. It was yeah. its own big yes, um, it was. channel. And so, you know, it gave you, like, a, a whole range, a wider audience yeah. and going into yeah. it. How many series was there about 14 TV? Two. Two, was it? Yeah. Two and a Christmas special. Two and a Christmas special. Oh, they did the Christmas special as well, yeah. didn't they, Mark? Yeah. yeah. But I think what, what this is leading to, as far as Lionel is concerned, is that once you have a successful television series, you become in inverted commas, a professional of your subject. Yes. And the go-to person yep. about, oh, we must talk to Reverend Lionel Fanthorpe. He's an expert on, on aliens, poltergeists, ghosts, hauntings. Anything except, abnormal. Except, yeah. 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 And that's why the likes of, was it Ancient Aliens? Yes. Talking Stones? Yeah. Yes. Haunted Castles? Or was yes, it? I did. Ca uh, castles, castles of Horror. Castles, castles of, of Horror, horror yeah. All those types of shows. Well, we had, I must just tell you about that. Um, and it was one of the most peculiar experiences. I mean, I've investigated all sorts of weird things for a long time, um, but this was a unique one. Um, Bat and I were in bed it was about three o'clock in the morning. We were staying in this hotel, mm. um, or it may even have been one of the ante rooms in the castle, but yeah. they'd put us up, and uh, it was Favelsburg, and. We'd been doing a long, heavy day's filming and we'd gone to bed about midnight and we are tired, fast asleep at half past three in the morning and there's a sudden urgent knocking on the door. I got up, peeped around to see what it was and it was our producer-director and he said, please could you come and help us, Father? So I said, yeah, what's the matter? He said, We've been trying to shoot a scene up on the castle roof on um, because in this Favelsberg place they had had in Nazi times they'd had all sorts of people executed in the building and they had also been earlier than Nazi times there'd been an enclave of witches down in one of the cellars one of the dungeons and uh, they were still believed to be about. The place mm. had this reputation of being very weird and strange and evil and haunted. 
and he said we were trying to film on the roof. something had happened on the roof oh 50 100 years ago when it was uh, one of the the legends associated with Wavelsburg and he said we were trying to film and he said my cameraman and the sound engineer and the assistant sound engineer and the assistant cameraman can't stand it up there. There's something evil up there that is frightening the life out of them and they won't go back. They won't finish the shoot. And they, they sent me down to ask you if you'd come up and exorcise it. So I said, yeah, sure. So I got dressed and went up on the roof with him and performed a prayer of exorcism. I blessed some water and sprinkled holy water everywhere around, which is what you do in the yeah. course of an exorcism. And uh, they all turned to me and said, it's gone, Fog. You, you, you've you driven it away. It, it won't come near you. And I said, well, hopefully, if I'm a, a sincere priest, it won't come near me. Because yeah, it's afraid of what a priest can do to it. Mm. And uh, that was the uh, episode there. And they then got on. I went back to bed and they shot the film that they were they were doing. It was just a sort of scenic piece they were trying to do of the haunted roof. They didn't need any actors in it. No, no, no. But uh, that was the uh, that was definitely Wavelsburg. And on another occasion, oh yes, had a very strange experience at the Skirid, the um, Skirid Inn. It's here in Wales. Okay, and. I remember being called to help them with that as well. There was, um, I'm trying to remember the exact episode. Oh yes, they. there had been a number of high-ranking German prisoners there at one point. And nearby, Rudolf Hess had been imprisoned. Mm. And he, on one occasion, had been taken to this Skirid Inn where his guard, because Hess behaved himself, his guard was sorry for him. He took him out of his cell, took him to the Skirid, bought him a drink, and then took him back to prison. And uh, his ghost was supposed to have been there, uh, the ghost of Rudolf Hess. And uh, I did an exorcism there because the, the team found the place Eerie, would you say? Eerie. Yeah. Mm, and, eerie. Uh, but there are a couple of occasions when I've been asked to do... Oh, and then there was the famous haunted car, which had the number plate 666. <laughs> and do you remember the stories of the haunted car? The Capri, I remember. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, the haunted that, Capri. Because you, you mentioned... Because I came to one of the... So sort of the lectures that you did in Cardiff University, it was yep. one of the book launch, and Emily... I came uh, with Emily. Uh, and it was the 666 six, six, yeah. haunted Capri. Uh I did an exorcism on that at the request of the owner. Yeah. Um, because, oh yeah, the other thing I did with that, I remember that was the, uh, uh, sounds a bit boastful, but I, um, what's that big cliff I was got? Beachy Head? Yeah, Beachy Head. Yeah. And I drove it along the edge of Beachy Head. Yeah. Because other people said they couldn't control it. Yeah. And I said, I'll control it. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> <coughs> I more or less said to whatever was haunting it, I said, I'm a priest and we're going on the edge of yeah. Beachy Head. And if we go, and if you take me over, you'll get more smashed up than I will. And uh, I just drove it calmly and uh, sensibly along the edge of Beachy Head. But we, you know, with a, how steep was it, about 200 feet? I don't feet? Know, but Steep enough, and then yeah. you went over. You wouldn't. Uh, no, you wouldn't. You, you, you meet wouldn't. Your maker, as they say. I no, think. you. Yeah, yeah, you would. You would meet your maker at the bottom. Yeah. But yeah. I think, in, in, in terms of you know the, 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 um, exorcisms and hauntings and poltergeists, is relevant to the content of of, of Reese's normal podcasts. Right. If you say, if you tell him about the um, cinema in Bristol, in films. Uh, oh yes, this is the Bristol cinema. Um, this poor bloke came to see me and said that he was one of the ushers in the cinema. Um, I'm trying to think what the cinema was called. I think it was the Odeon. Oh, the, the Odeon cinema was, yeah. The, the o Odeon at Bristol, I think. But without looking it up in my book, I yeah, can't yeah. Um, And um, you will find it, it'll be on the internet, mm. the uh, haunted Odeon. And there was just one passageway that he couldn't walk down 
And if I remember rightly, there'd been a murder committed there. Somebody, um, I think it was um, a problem about one girl and two rival boyfriends, and one of them had killed the other as he left the cinema. He actually stabbed him in that narrow walkway as you got the door. And this poor usher couldn't work, because he said it was the ghost of the man who'd been murdered was allegedly haunting this passageway from the main seating area to the exit door. So uh, the manager phoned me after this bloke had been to see me and said, I would love to have him back. He's first class member of my staff, but he's terrified of that one aisle where the murder was committed. Would you be willing to come over and exorcise it for us? And, uh, I said, yeah, of course I will. And uh, I went over there and uh, perform the exorcism, you know, you, you bless the water yeah, yeah. and sprinkle the holy water and say the prayer of exorcism. And uh, the guy went back and he got it and he said, uh, it hasn't been back since you exorcised it, Father. I said, well, I'm very glad you've got your job back. Your manager has got an employee whom he greatly depends upon back, so you're both happy and I'm happy to have made you yeah. happy and that's it. And... Uh, I think there's there's an attitudinal thing in exorcism. There's some priests who won't touch it with a ten foot mm. pole. There, um, they say that they don't feel it's um, in keeping with orthodox theology. Um, what I secretly think is that they're probably scared of it. They're not mm. they're not willing to do it. Not able. They're not able yeah. to take on the, the uh, forces that be. A uh, dark force. Yeah. yeah. Um, whereas being a being a judo man, a wrestler and a boxer, <laughs> I would take on anything psychologically as well as physically. I still would. You, and, you know what, whenever you mention, um, you know, being a judo man and uh, the boxing, etc., you, yeah. you remind me of the character... Um, Father, Father Damien in The Exorcist. Uh, obviously, the ending, obviously the ending is a bit different, but you just remind me of him because yeah. it's the fact that it's just that scene where the the, the girl possessed um, has has killed um, Max von Sydow's character, or yep. he's had a heart attack, so he's trying to revive him, and then the the so the demon child is laughing away, and he's like, "Oh no, you come here," and he goes. Bam, bam, starts peeing him. Just remind, you just remind me of that. Yeah, yeah. I just picture that going, yeah, because that's yes. like a natural thing yes, to I, do. Yes, it would. It's, it's what I would have yeah. done. In the you bitch. Yeah. So, but, you'd, you'd try that. <laughs> I think the the last question here on my podcast here, yep. I know, and it's always been asked, but I've always asked my guests this. Yeah. Um, how do you look back on your career? That is a wonderful question. Um. I look back thinking I've already had nearly 20 years more life than the average life expectancy, so I'm very thankful. I look back on, let's just think. I was very unsettled as a teenager when I left school. I, you know, I went from job to job to job to job. I couldn't find anything I liked. And it wasn't until I had sort of undergone a religious experience and accepted God and Christianity and the Christian faith in the broadest sense that I settled down. Um, now, my career, I would think, um, had its most important day when a friend of mine said to me one day, do you know there's a great shortage of uncertificated teachers? Um, are you interested? You got you, you know, he said, I think it'd be good for kids. And I said, well, if you think so. So I applied to the local secondary modern school and they took me on with both arms. Oh, yes, please, I'm about five teachers yeah. short. And I did a couple of three years uncertificated. And then one of my pals on the staff said, because in those days, you got paid for going to college. You got a huge grant instead of having to instead of having to bankrupt yourself going to college. And uh, I'd only been earning about three to four thousand a year, and I got a grant of five thousand for being a student. And I went to Norwich Teachers Training College, 
and uh, then came back to the same school, but as a, a qualified teacher, and had a, a, a wonderfully happy time there. Thanked my friend who'd recommended me to go and get qualified. And then um, I saw an advert for um, a job in Cambridgeshire where they had the village colleges and they had two deputy heads in the village called one of whom was called the further education tutor and who was in charge of all the youth work and the uh, <coughs> the evening classes and the other guy who was called the deputy head because it was a warden in charge of the whole lot and the deputy head ran the day school and the job I went for uh, to be the um, uh, you know the further education tutor mm. and I took that on and I was there for three years and then I was uh, arranging for um, arranging for guests and uh, one of the special guest spe celebrity speakers and one of the guys I invited was Victor Serebriakov who actually called himself Victor Seri because people had trouble pronouncing his Russian name. And uh, he was the um, president of Mensa. And uh, because I was in Mensa, I invited him as, you know, and he said, oh, yes, if you remember, I'll come. And he came and gave a wonderful lecture. A week later, I got a phone call from the Phoenix Timber Company of Raynham, Essex. And their personnel manager said, um, Mr. Seri has just asked me to invite you to come and meet our managing director um, because he thinks you would be ideal as the, they then brought all this business in. I don't know if you'd remember it, Mark. I think it was before your time. Mm -hmm. um, they, the government brought in management consultancy training. Mm -hmm. I've I've heard of uh, you, you heard, uh, yeah I've heard of, yeah and anyway being brought up by grandparents and everything you yeah of course of, your yeah. granddad would have told you anyway I got uh, I got invited to become their industrial training manager mm. so uh, um, you know management and training consultant and the government paid your wages the company didn't have to so I was then on about a thousand a year yeah uh, as money was in those days. And uh, I thought, well, if they, they they said, we'd love you to come and do it for us. How much do you want? So I said, oh, 2,000 will do. And uh, which was double what I was on at the moment. <laughs> and uh, then when I got there, they liked what I did and I got promoted uh, again. And I was, I was on 3,000 a year, and which was the equivalent of 80 or 90,000 now uh, in comparative, you know, well, what currency was like then. But um, good as the salary was, I wanted to go back to teaching. I took my career at heart. I was a teacher. Mm. And I decided, no, I'm going back to teaching. And I went to, uh, I answered some adverts in the Times Educational Supplement got invited to go for an interview at Helsden in Norwich, which was, again, being a Norfolkman, was my old hometown. And I met an amazing bloke, head of the Helsden School, just outside Norwich, called Thomas Rhys Taylor, who was a good Welshman. And uh, With that name as well, Thomas Rhys Taylor. He's got to be, yeah. <laughs> he's got to be. And he... <coughs> uh, no governor's meeting. He, he said... Right, you're just the man I want. You've got the job. When can you start? <laughs> so I told Phoenix I was leaving and uh, went to work for Tommy Taylor. Tommy retired and we got another head. Well, the school expanded enormously. It was a time when they were getting bigger and bigger. Got up to about 1,400 kids. And the new headmaster I did not get on with. He just wasn't my type of bloke. I loved Tommy. I'd have done anything for Tom. But this other guy... I'd couldn't cope with so I thought well uh, I'll apply for a headship and I applied for two or three got interviewed to it two or three and got the one in Wales mm -hmm. down, down here in Cardiff in Glenderu 
And they'd had a rather strange time because the previous headmaster, his name was Harold Eyre, had been very, very ill, came back, insisted on coming back, though he wasn't by any means fit, had a heart attack and died in the head's toilet. And uh, I thought every time there was a separate headmaster's toilet attached to the head's office, and I thought every time I used it over the years I was there, poor old, uh, poor old uh, Harold Eyre died in this loo. <laughs> Help. And, uh, His ghost wasn't there, was it? No, I never saw any ghosts. No, never saw any ghosts. I never had to, never had to exercise that one. <laughs> and uh, just flush your chain when you leave. <laughs> that's yeah, that's it. That's it. With the, bless the water. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I was there for a few years, and then I was ill, and uh, took early retirement. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was uh, yes, that was the one that I told you about earlier, where I told this boy to bring his yeah. father and five friends yeah. to protect my music teacher. <laughs> so um, as a whole, as a writer, presenter, all the things you've done as a teacher and everything, you, you look back with fond memories. and very Yes, I look back with, I think I have, you know, the individual fond memory goes with the individual job, but there were things I greatly enjoyed. Um, way back when I hadn't even left school, I was working part-time as a dental technician, got on incredibly well with the dental technician. He was an ex-army dental technician who was teaching me. And one little episode here that might entertain you, um, I got, uh, it was a very long, thin laboratory. And Alan, who was teaching me, always got me to look after the vulcanizer. Now, a vulcanizer goes up to 110 pounds per square inch in order to change rubber into vulcanite. And there were vulcanite dentures in those days. And Alan always sat at the far end and said, oh, he showed me how to do it. He said, Lionel, can you see the vulcanizer? Yeah, OK, Alan. And he always sat as far as he could. And I asked him one day when, we got, when we'd become good friends, I said, Alan, you don't like that vulcanizer, do you? No, he said, I'll tell you why. He said, that's why I'm ever so grateful to you for doing it. He said, when I was in the army, we were out in a desert somewhere and we had a vulcanizer that worked on methylated spirit. And the blessed thing went wrong and went up to about 150 pounds the square inch and blew up. <laughs> and my dental officer grabbed me, we were in, in the desert, flung me down and lay on top of me, um, which I thought was a, a genuinely noble thing to do. If you were an officer, say, in your 30s and you've got a young... Uh, you've got an 18 year old with you mm. and uh, you treat him if you're a decent officer you treat him like your son mm. and you look after him and he he said the dental officer flung me down and lay on top of me to protect me and the top of the vulcanizer which was the size of a discus mm. weighed about five pounds no or three kilogram had gone up to a height of nearly 100 feet number the explosion yeah and he'd seen it beginning its path down. And he said it landed about five feet away from us in the oh, sand. Wow. He said if it had hit either of us, it'd have been killed. It, it was, you know, you got a metal yeah, metal yeah. plate the size of it would just cut into you. Good night, but, Irene. <laughs> yeah, and it, I just, he, he was thinking then of how, how brave his officer was, the, the dental surgeon, the army dental surgeon. And he said, from that time on, I would have done anything for him, you know, when, mm. when we worked together in the dental school. So that was why he said, he said, I won't go near a vulcanizer anymore. He said, no. we, d we didn't get many customers with um, vulcanite, but uh, so I became the vulcanizing expert. <laughs> and Alan and I were great friends. He was a brilliant musician, and he ran a little dance band called the Alan Thacker Quartet. And... I used to go with them and help the drummer carry his kit when we were, I was their roadie. <laughs> and uh, you'd have great fun with that. So, you know, you'd have an all night session with the band and then two hours later you'd meet for work and start mending volunteers. <laughs> <coughs> that, that was just a happy experience there. Um, when I went to um, the, the clock factory, that was one of the momentous occasions in my life. Because I was on this swing press that I was telling you about earlier. And one of the guys I met while I was there 
was a driller and he would go around, he was mobile whereas the rest of us weren't. And so he would come round and pick up things that had to be drilled, take them to his lab and then do the drilling and bring them back. His name was Ernie Kemper. And Ernie was courting Pat, my Patricia's elder sister. And he said one day, my girlfriend has a younger sister who's a very nice girl and she hasn't got a boyfriend and she's coming round for tea with us next Sunday. Can you come? She'd like to meet you. <laughs> yes, please. And I said, we've been very happily married for 65 years. But I met her through Ernie, who was going out with her elder sister. So uh, I said, Ernie became a great friend. And uh, I went from, when I went from the factory to, I was, um, Victor Seri became a great friend of mine. When I, oh, I, I hadn't met him. When I first went to college, um, going back to that little bit uh, career there, I got on particularly well with um, the English tutor in the college. His name was Jones. And he, I handed him one essay he'd set us, and he called me into his office and said, this is about, uh, I came, I finished up as either first or second equal out of 103 students in our year. I don't want to boast about it, but I was... This English tutor, you know, said um, how much he'd enjoyed the essay I'd done. I, he couldn't praise it enough. And then he said, uh, you're a... Aren't you a writer as well? I said, yes, Dr. Jones, I uh, do science fiction. He said, that's where it comes from. And he said, it's... Uh, he said, that essay could only have been written by a professional writer. I said, thank you very much, sir. And then he said, have you ever thought about joining Mensa? And I, I said, I, I'm sorry, I don't know what it is. Well, what is it? And he explained what it was. And he said, I think you do. And I went up for, you know, the IQ test. And it was, uh, pass mark was about 100, I think it was 138 in those. You had to be in the top 2% on that particular test. And... Uh, I did about 145, I was about seven points up on the uh, what the pass mark was. So I joined. And then I said I invited Vic Seri across to lecture when I was at Gambling Gay. And then Vic obviously liked what I was doing there and told his personnel manager to invite me to come and be their training manager, which I did. And I, so I got the job and... Uh, the, the bloke who run the place, ran the place was called Alexander Gurvich. He was Russian. And he and his uncle had come over at the time of the Russian Revolution and uh, to escape. But they had retained their contact with the Russian timber suppliers. And these Russian timber suppliers were able to get wood to Phoenix Timber when nobody else could get it. And it was just after the war and everybody wanted to rebuild the damaged houses. And Phoenix could supply the timber when nobody... And then there was an unfortunate fire um, after they'd been there a little while. Not too much damage. But that's why they decided to call it the Phoenix Timber Company instead of the Gurvich mm. Timber Company. Phoenix, they'd, they'd survived the flames. Yeah. And... Uh, I said, my great friend there was Vic Seri, who was also in Mensa, well, he was the Mensa president. And uh, I made a lot of good friends there. And that was uh, a good place to work, and a happy place. Yeah. And yeah. then from there, uh, I went back into teaching, and uh, I liked... And they see the rest is history, isn't the it? The rest is history. I, I got on so well with um, friends at Helsden, and then when I went into... Uh, came to Wales as, as headmaster uh, headmaster there and made a lot of good friends on the staff there before I was ill and uh, then uh, that, and there you see me now <laughs> still writing a bit for Mark <laughs> well Lionel Lionel Fanthorpe thank you so much for coming on the podcast uh, really means a lot that oh. you can find the time to have a nice chat and talk about I mean you've talked so much it's, I mean yeah. 
the biography, I hope you're writing a biography soon, yeah. so I'd be more than happy to uh, read it. And Yes, I'm, but, do, I'm doing it now. <laughs> oh, here we go then. Yeah. But anyway, thank you so much uh, for being a guest on Creative Space Podcast. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. No worries. <laughs> Are you looking for the perfect bracelet for a loved one? Would your man be interested in a personalized keyring from his children? Are you looking for the best priced jewelry, whether it be a necklace, ring, earrings, bangle, or even more? Look no further than Crafted Arts. Crafted Arts is a local business based in Barry within the Vale of Morgan, and they have a range of all the perfect items you need. If it's for the perfect gift for an anniversary, or maybe it's for someone's birthday, maybe something for Christmas, or you wanted to give someone that perfect gift that will last a long time, Crafted Arts is the business for you. If you want to know more or see what they have in stock, then you can visit them locally at 29 High Street, Barry, Villa Morgan, CF627EB. Or you can go onto their website at www.craftedarts.co.uk. You can even email them at info at craftedarts.co.uk or maybe just give them a call at 077-89-94248. Trust me, it's worth it for the perfect gift. The best thing about Creative Space is that we don't just want to encourage people in being creative in TV, film, or even theater. We also want you to be creative in a variety of other things as well. So do you want to have experience in making jewelry? Do you want to pick up a hobby, but do not know what to take or where to start? Then look no further than the Veil Jewelry Workshops. Veil Jewelry Workshops provides the best experience in teaching you how to make the best sterling silver jewelry. They will help you make a range of silverware, including rings, bracelets, and many more pieces. You will learn the basic silversmith skills, such as soldering, texturing, shaping, and lots more. Not only do the workshops provide the experience for adults, it also provides the best experience and fun for children as well. So if you want to learn on how to make sterling silver jewelry, and if you're very interested, go onto their website at www.veildewerryworkshops.co.uk or get in touch with them via email at info at veildewerryworkshops.co.uk or even phone them at 077897942。We're Billboard Ensemble. Uh-huh. And have we got news for you. You better listen. Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, is coming to the Memo Art Center from the 20th to the 23rd of July, featuring 25 dance floor classics such as I Will Survive, Hot Stuff, Go West, and many more. Tickets on sale now at memoartcenter.co.uk or call at 01446 738 622.